Okay, good evening. We uh, can I get this meeting started tonight. Uh, we have some uh, festive background uh, in the meeting meeting room tonight, uh, courtesy of MTC. So that's what is sparkling behind some of the board members. So uh, I will hand it over to Chair McCann to start the meeting. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, welcome to everyone here tonight. It's great to see people here in person, and welcome to everyone who's online as well. My name is Jacinda McCann. I'm the chair of the BCDC's Design Review Board. I'm located here at the Metro Center in San Francisco, and our meeting will include participants who are here and those who are participating online. Our first order of business will be to call the roll. Board members, please unmute yourselves to respond and then mute yourselves again after responding. So, um, Andrea, can you call the roll? Yeah, I'll start with you, Chair McCann. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Strang. Present. Uh, board member Kristen Hall. Present. Stefan Pellegrini. Present. Uh, Bob Battaglio. Present. Uh, Tom Leader. Here. Okay, we have six members in attendance. Uh, four in person and two are online. Okay, thanks, Andrea. And so we have a quorum present and we are duly constituted to conduct business. I want to share some instructions on how we can best participate in this meeting so that it runs as smoothly as possible. For everyone online and in the meeting room, please make sure that you have your microphones or phones muted to avoid background noise. For board members, if you have a webcam, please make sure it's on uh, and uh, so everyone can see you. For members of the public, if you would like to speak during the public comment period that is part of an agenda item, you will need to do so in one of two ways. First, if you are attending on the Zoom platform, please raise your virtual hand in Zoom. If you are new to Zoom and you've joined our meeting using the Zoom application, click the hand at the bottom of your screen. The hand should turn blue when it's raised. The second way, if you're joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your keypad to raise or lower your hand to make a comment, and star six to mute or unmute your phone. We will call on individuals who have raised their hands in the order that they are raised during the public comment period for each project. The second way, if you're, um, excuse me, <clears throat> after you are called on, you will be unmuted so that you can share your comments. Please state your name and affiliation at the beginning of your remarks. Remember, you have a limit of three minutes to speak on an item, and we will tell you when you have one minute remaining. Please keep your comments respectful and focused. We are here to listen to everyone who wishes to address us, but everyone has the responsibility to act in a civil manner. We will not tolerate hate speech, threats made directly or indirectly, and or abusive language. We will mute anyone who fails to follow these guidelines or who exceeds the established time lim limits without permission. For public comments, please note that we will only hear your voices. You will, your video will not be enabled. For members of the public attending our meeting in person in the headquarters building, I will ask you to maintain social distance during the meeting. The board secretary will call you up to the podium for public comment. Wearing masks is optional, but recommended in this building. You will be asked to come up to the podium one at a time and to state your name and affiliation prior to uh, providing your comments during the meeting. If you would like to add your contact information to the interested parties list to be notified of future meetings concerning these projects, please call or email Ashley Tomalin, whose contact information is on the screen uh, in front of you or found on BCDC's website. Finally, every now and again, you'll hear me refer to the meeting host, who is Ashley. Our BCDC staff are acting as hosts for the meeting behind the scenes to ensure that the technology moves the meeting forward smoothly and consistently. Please be patient with us if it's needed. And now the board secretary will provide a staff update. So over to you, Andrea. Uh, thanks, Chair McCann. Um, have a few updates, uh, and then that will be followed by the um, board selection process briefing. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can get the slides to advance. Okay. So starting out with project updates um, on. This past Friday, uh, BCDC staff, along with board member Bob Battaglio, met with staff from the Port of Oakland and the Army Corps to discuss the beach design at Middle Harbor Shoreline Park. Um, I just want to give Bob a brief opportunity to report out on that meeting um, as a form of ex parte communication. Thank you. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, at the request of the VCDC staff, I, we, we had a discussion that lasted about an hour. Um, uh, we discussed some of my thoughts on the beach enhancement possibilities and a uh, new concept came up which entailed uh, grading the existing beach a little differently than they had shown. And I don't know if they're going to look at that or not, but that was um, something that made sense to me. So that was it. That was basically the conversation. I don't know. Andrea, if there's anything else I should I should mention. No, I think that's it. Um, I think I think the Port of Oakland is going to look at the the design proposal and will continue to work with BCDC staff on the beach as well as the master plan. Um, they indicated to us that the master plan would be ready for staff review in February, um, mm -hmm. as well as the management plan. Um, in other news concerning Middle Harbor Shoreline Park, the 7th Street grade separation east project, um, which was the longer term portion of the east span of the project, has received $175 million in funding and will move forward with the relocation and redesign of the railroad underpass, which includes an expanded and improved bike ped connection. Um, They're also going to continue to develop the interim design solutions at the same time as the final project is developed. Um, and as noted, you've requested that this project return for another review. So we'll update you as to when the project is scheduled for that review. But these are some updates some and good and progress. And to clarify that, they'll be running on separate timelines, correct? Uh, Which? The 7th seventh, the seventh Street. Uh, yeah, the 7th seven, Street yeah. design review will yeah. run on a separate timeline from the master plan and management plan. Yeah, they're working on both of them, but at different delivery dates. Yeah. Uh, so other updates um, on Thursday, this coming December 15th, the commission will vote on 200 twin dolphin, uh, which is a um, biotech project in Redwood City that you reviewed in May. Um, this is the second project this year that has gone through the DRB and the commission in under a year. Um, and this is no small accomplishment, so I wanna thank you for your advice on these projects. Um, there are at least four more projects that were re reviewed this year that will be submitting applications soon. So 2023 will be a busy one for the commission. Lots of development happening in that area. Um, the third uh, project update is the planning division has kicked off Bay Adapt Regional Shoreline Adaptation Planning Efforts, which has an 18 month timeline to produce a regional adaptation plan and guidelines. Uh, the planning staff will be interested in your input as the guidelines are developed. Um, so stay tuned for more information about reviewing and commenting on that topic as it develops. Uh, next up is new public access, um, Alameda Landing, is nearing completion on the waterfront in Alameda, and a portion has already been opened to the public. Um, Ashley continues to work on the plan review for that project, but a portion of it is now open if you wanna go visit. Uh, the images on this slide are from Pier 70 at 22nd Street. Um, it's still under construction, but is uh, shaping up into its future form. Uh, it's pretty exciting to see. So uh, next up, staffing updates. Um, so I attended my first DRB meeting in September of 2016. Uh, I had not started your work yet, but was curious to see how the meeting was ran because I was about to become the secretary. The San Leandro Marina redevelopment project was being reviewed at that meeting. So I find it fitting that tonight's meeting is also reviewing that project as this will be my last meeting as the secretary. Uh, as you know, some projects take time to develop, which is why your board service is so important. Since 2016, I have served as the secretary for 48 DRB meetings, during which the board has reviewed 111 projects and heard 13 briefings. And I have learned so much from serving as the board secretary. 
as a quick reflection on what we've done together. Uh, here's a list of projects that the board has reviewed over the past six years. I've color coded them to show their progress. Um, most of the projects have been permitted and are in blue. Um, the ones in green are permitted and constructed and open to the public. Um, the two gray ones have an active permit application and are heading to the commission soon. Uh, and the orange yellow ones are a handful that we know have permit applications coming next year. And then the projects in white are running on longer timelines, which is, you know, sometimes how projects go. And this sort of cumulative list is to show you the impacts of your board service. It's pretty important. Uh, recently, I've started making a map of the locations around the bay that I've worked on over the past six years. I'm only about halfway through inputting the projects, but it's a relatively consistent density across most of the Bay Area. And I'm sharing this with you to show you that staff works on a significantly larger amount of projects than those brought to the board. But we take the comments and discussions at the board and incorporate them into all of our work on the shoreline. So your work has an even larger impact than you might have imagined. There are some great spaces along the shoreline that have been made better because of your advice and expertise as provided to both project proponents and staff. It has been a pleasure working with all of you. And I will be leaving you in the capable hands of Ashley Tomerlin who has been the steadfast co-host of the online meeting since 2020. The next DRB meeting is tentatively scheduled for February 6th, 2023, but there are no items on the agenda uh, at this time, so it may be pushed until March, but uh, Ashley will provide you an update in January as to whether that meeting will happen. And that concludes my staff update, and if there's any questions, I can pause here, and if not, I will go on to the board succession appointment briefing. Well, well Andrea, uh, we have to pause here because uh, this is a very um, sad evening for us all on the DRB to be saying goodbye to you, and those graphics that you put up, uh, I think you, you paid up a compliment by saying how much impact the board has had, but uh, really I would just want to reverse that and say what an incredible impact you've had on the, the work of the BCDC in respect to the, the shoreline areas that um, we have the privilege to provide some input into. But the, I clearly remember the, um, well, I clearly remember the review, not clearly remember you sitting there, <laughs> I have to say, but I clearly remember that review, and it's a long time ago. And so uh, when you think about the uh, level of impact that you've had on projects, the way in which you've taken uh, the feedback, made it cohesive, being able to work with your team, with Ashley and all the other people, Ethan, all the others that we have seen over the years, and to you know, be able to consistently and coherently strive for the best possible outcomes, I think is an incredible accomplishment. So you should feel really proud of everything that you've accomplished here. And I just want to say how much on behalf of the board, we appreciate your hard work, dedication, creativity. And, uh, and I can say this firsthand because we talk before every board meeting and you know, just the, uh, the, the real uh, intelligence that you, um, and sensitivity that you bring to all the issues. So we will miss you. We want to wish you well. And we know your next move will be very successful and we want, want to wish you the well, all the best. And um, we welcome Ashley as well. And we'll be looking forward to working with you going forward. And uh, I'll pause here. Maybe anyone else might like to add something as well. Uh, I don't know that I can say anything better than that, but it's been a pleasure working with you. You've carried the board through a whole generation of work and, um, um, you know, really a, 
here is going to, I think the entire board has probably turned over since you were here practically. I probably started uh, a couple years before, but as an alternate. So really, I think we've had very parallel histories here. And so again, uh, also in addition to everything that Jacinta said, I think you've dealt with a lot of logistics. There was the pandemic. There was the technology changes, the new building, um, many, many things that you were doing besides uh, working on waterfront sites. So I want to thank you for all that. And best of luck. Um, again, I, that was a, those were lovely words, um, and I echo them. And I, you know, you were here when I started not that long ago, and you were incredibly helpful to me as I got my feet underneath me as a board member. And I'm having a hard time imagining what it'll be like without you here, shepherding us and bringing clarity and guidance. And I think, you know, you are a designer's designer. You have a lot of design background, but you also are able to bridge to the policy. And I think not all designers can do that. And you've been so helpful with us all here, you know, giving us the guidance and policy support to help make those designs that much better. So really appreciate all of the work that you've done. And um, Ashley, look forward to your new role. And thank you so much. Thanks very much, Andrea. Um, You've known me for a very long time, so you know that I won't say much now, but you know how I feel inside. And uh, welcome, Ashley. I would, I would just add, um, I, I, I agree with everything everybody said and totally support it. And I think, uh, Andrea, you've, uh, I just wanna compliment the, uh, the patience and the tact that you've shown, you know, dealing with us, managing us, and I'll never remember, I'll never forget being on a, some highway up in Sonoma and getting a call from you. He says, well, Tom, we're all sitting around here waiting to start the meeting. Where are you? <laughs> and uh, managing us through that one was, uh, was something. Uh, anyway, I, I just, not to be uh, humorous about it, but thank you so much for your, the, the humanistic uh, talents you bring. I guess I'll just um, provide, I think, the last comments. Andrea, you've been uh, in your position ever since I joined the board, so this is um, not going to be easy for me. Uh, but um, I'm really excited about your new endeavors and opportunities. I don't claim to fully understand them, but it sounds exciting, and, and I wish you the best. Hope to see you around. Yeah, maybe I'll see you in the water. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I'll be there. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to take any more of the meeting with that. Uh, we can move on to the briefing. Um, let me switch presentations here for a second. Okay, um, so this is going to be a, a very short briefing, but it's just a walk you through the board selection process. Um, as a reminder, this is a board made up of seven members of design professions, and we need to have at least one architect, one landscape architect, and one engineer um, on the board. Um, there's also seven alternates. Uh, we recently revised the regulations for that, um, and there's three terms of five-year service. So current board, uh, Andrew Wolfram stepped down and became an alternate. And so we need to find an architect to replace that board seat. And 
for alternates, we have six spaces that we're looking to fill, but I don't think we should fill them all at once uh, because we want to have some staggering in turnover. Excuse me. Um, so uh, at minimum, filling the architect board seat uh, and then the landscape architect and civil, civil engineer alternates uh, meet the required minimums for the board, uh, but I also recommend that we look for an urban planner for the alternates as well. And so this is just showing you that information in a slightly different way. Um, and then again, this is also showing you in a different way. Um, you can think about these uh, in a list. Uh, if you have names that come to mind for any of these positions, uh, please email Ashley uh, and we will work on uh, beginning to compile the list. In terms of uh, selection criteria, um, this is what we used on the last round of appointments. Um, and we looked at design experience in waterfront projects, uh, knowledge of the commission's laws and policies, the ability to do design review, either in a academic setting or professional, like a board design review board, such as this one, um, interest in the future of the waterfront, and then breadth of professional experience uh, in relation to a larger list of characteristics developed by board members. Um, and I have that list if you want to go over it tonight, but um, it generally uh, calls back to a discussion we had in, I think, sort of 2019. Um, <clears throat> in addition to these criteria, we had an unstated goal to provide opportunities for a more diverse candidate pool, um, including recruiting women, um, BIPOC, and queer community members. Um, so that was an unstated goal last time, perhaps it's more of a stated goal this time around. So the next step, so we've already, you know, established that the um, current board members who are up for term have renewed their term for the third term. So we only need one board appointment and three alternate appointments. And the next step will be for the chair and vice chair to form a special committee um, to conduct the interviews and make the recommendations for the board appointments. Um, and that's something we can talk about doing tonight or you can decide to do at another meeting. But um, once the special committee is formed, um, we can put together a solicitation, a public solicitation for applications. Um, and then identify the list of candidates, um, conduct interviews, and then make recommendations for appointments. And there's been a slight change in the regulations. So now that when the board members make the recommendations to the commission, the chair of the commission only needs to provide concurrence. So it doesn't need to go through a hearing and a vote. And then once the new uh, board member and alternates are appointed, staff does an orientation and then we start the process all over again. Um, so that's, that's my briefing, it's pretty brief. Um, but the, I guess the main question for the board tonight is, you know, do you, would you want to put forward the motion to form the special committee tonight? Um, it needs to be a committee of two um, for public meeting reasons. If you have three board members, it constitutes a public meeting. Um, and so we keep it at two with staff um, so that you can have um, candid discussions and interviews um, and sort of respect the privacy of the candidates throughout the um, application and interview process. Oh. Gary, I think we should put the motion tonight to form that committee so we can move forward. Sound right? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll put the motion forward uh, that we form a special committee with the chair and vice chair to interview and select new board members and alternates. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. 
Motion carried. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ashley will uh, reach out to you probably in the new year about next steps and um, following through this process. And I'll work with her on that before I leave. So. Great. And if I could just add, you mentioned it, but I think it's a really important opportunity for all the board members to submit uh, potential candidates so that we can get as wide a pool as possible mm. and accomplish the goals and particularly the latter goals that you talked about from a diversity standpoint. So. Um, I think this one last slide, um, just to show you, um, these were the considerations that were brought forward previously. So the um, the ones that are past knowledge considerations were from you know 2012, 2016, and then the the current ones for you know an architectural historian, and shoreline benthic ecologist, community based designer. Those were from the 2018, 2019 discussions. Um, so if there's additional considerations that you'd like to have, um, you can either bring those forward in special committee or you can have that discussion as a full board um, at a, a following public meeting. So. Okay. Good. That concludes my briefing. Um, before we move on, Karen has sent a text message and she would like to say a few words to Andrea via this text message, if it's okay if I read that out. Yes, okay. please go ahead. So this is Karen speaking. Uh, Andrea, as you open your last DRB meeting, please know for sure that you will be sorely missed and yet still celebrated for all you brought to the DRB. Number one, organization. Focus on what truly matters as we learn something new each day and each decade. Your wonderful bumpy bike rides with video that made sure the power of the site was always in the room. Respect for the Bay and its ever evolving power in our lives and so much more. We congratulate you on new ventures. We thank you and we will surely remain your fan club. From Karen Alshuler, 25 plus year DRB member and recent chair, and on to the future. Love, Karen. Thank you. And thank you, Karen. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, we, we do need to provide for public, public comment, comment on the briefing <coughs> if there is any. Um, yes. So if anyone is attending online and would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand now to speak. And if you're attending online, just a reminder, if you want to make a public comment, please raise the virtual hand. And if you're joining our meeting via phone, you have to press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand to make a comment. To unmute or mute, press star six. And we'll just wait to see if anyone. I don't see anyone, is. so. Okay, I, I won't go yeah. into more detail yeah. on that. Okay, so I think public comment uh, is closed. So with that, we will move to the next agenda item, which is the third review of San Leandro Shoreline Development Project. And uh, this is item four, and the project is in Alameda County. So to remind you of the project review order, we'll have a staff introduction, followed by a, the project proponent presentation, the board clarifying questions, public comment, board discussion and summary, and then the project proponent response, which is usually just a, a brief response at the end on critical issues you may have um, want to pick up on. And so with that, the BCDC permit, anal permit anal analyst, Catherine Pan, will int introduce the project. So Catherine, over to you.
Thank you, Chair McCann, uh, and good evening, board members. I'm Catherine Pan, the Principal Shoreline Development Analyst at BCDC. And before I present the staff introduction, I would like to remind the project team and staff to please turn on your video when you're speaking or answering questions. And when you're not actively engaged with the board, please turn off your video so that we can minimize the distractions on screen. Uh, and now I'm happy to introduce the project for tonight's review. This is the third review of the Monarch Bay Shoreline Development Project in the city of San Leandro and Alameda County. The proposed project is located at the San Leandro Marina in the city of San Leandro, about one mile south of the Oakland International Airport and two miles southwest of downtown San Leandro and the San Leandro BART station. The marina is situated just south of the Oyster Point Regional Shoreline and just north of Marina Park. To orient you to the project site and vicinity, uh, here you can see San Leandro Marina to the west of Monarch Bay Drive. The land surrounding the marina is made up of two peninsulas. To the north and west is Mulford Point, and on the south is Pescador Point. All portions of the project within BCDC's jurisdiction are on the marina side of Monarch Bay Drive. This is where the project proponents are proposing a public park, some new commercial buildings, and a multifamily residential building. To the east is the Marina Golf Course, which is where the new single-family homes and townhomes are being proposed. The project site is accessible from Monarch Bay Drive, which becomes Marina Boulevard in the north and eventually connects to I-880 about a mile away. And the site can also be accessed via Fairway Drive in the south. And then before I continue, uh, we'd like to acknowledge that the land in this area is located in the territory of Kuchin, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lisjan Ohlone peoples. We offer gratitude to the indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the bountiful bay, uh, natural resources of the Bay Area. Uh, now let's take a look at the current site conditions at the marina. Uh, this area to the west of Monarch Bay Drive is approximately 36 acres, not including the water area, and approximately 59 acres with the water area. The marina has 455 slips, and in 2020, the marina occupancy was estimated to be less than 30%, which is attributed to the heavy siltation that occurs at the marina and in the channel. The land surrounding the marina is developed with a few commercial uses, such as Horatio's Restaurant, the El Torito Restaurant, and the Marina Inn, uh, and two yacht clubs, the San Leandro Yacht Club and the Spinnaker Yacht Club. On Mulford Point, there is the remnant foundation of the demolished Blue Dolphin Restaurant, and there's also a fishing pier, a boat ramp, and some public access facilities and about 1,800 parking spaces and surface parking throughout the site. So about the public access facilities, there are a handful of existing BCDC permits active at the project site. This graphic shows the public access facilities that were required in the permit special condition. As you can see, there are a few pathways and green spaces as well as the boat ramp off of Pescador Point. There are also some access facilities that were tied to projects that were not built, like the relocated boat launch here, um, or the conference center at the Blue Dolphin here. In addition to these, there is an existing on-street bay trail segment along uh, the Marina Golf Course on Monarch Bay Drive that is not connected to a permit, which connects to striped facilities south of Fairway Drive and on Marina Boulevard. Um, Here's an aerial that came out, um, came out of one of the city's presentations back in 2016. Um, I think it's a nice image and does uh, help to show that the site is mostly paving. Um, here's the approach to the marina coming from the north on Monarch Bay Road. Uh, you can see there's a little sidewalk to the right that leads to the parking lot at the top of Mulford Point where it ends. And then some views from Mulford Point. Um, here's from the north. Um, at the corner, at uh, the northwest, and then at the tip. Um, so you can see there's a little public access space uh, at the end. And then the same for Pescador Point. Uh, this first is from the southern approach on Monarch Bay Drive going west. Uh, and here is the public access area um, and fishing pier at the end of Pescador Point. So this is actually the third review of this project. Uh, the, the last time the DRB saw it was in September 2016. The project proponents will mention this in their presentation, but here's a brief look at the previous iteration of the project, which would have placed a lot of development on the peninsula side of Monarch Bay Drive. 
including residential, office, commercial, and hotel uses, um, and some active recreation areas included in the public access spaces. At the end of the September meeting, um, the 2016 meeting, the uh, board concluded that there were still concerns about the big picture of the project, its massing, site design, and sea level rise adaptation, and stated that they wanted to see the project again. Uh, again, this will be described more fully in the project proponent's presentation, but you'll see major differences are the intensity of development on the peninsulas. Peninsulas has greatly decreased in the current version, uh, with most private development moving east of Monarch Bay Drive onto the golf course, and there's a bigger focus on continuous public access on the western side. Uh, there's also a decrease in the amount of in-water construction. For example, there's no bridge component anymore, uh, no beach, and no repurposed boat slips. Here's a look at the community vulnerability mapping tool output for the area. You'll see there's some variation here between high and low, uh, but it seems to be due to the odd shapes of the different block groups in the area. Basically, there are block groups that the tool has identified as having highest and high social vulnerability, as well as a census tract with highest contamination vulnerability. The relevant factors vary. No two block groups have the same set of indicators, but some common ones include the rate of renter households, people of color, individuals over 65 living alone, limited English proficiency, non-US citizens, and low-income households. Contamination vulnerability is attributed to things like the presence of hazardous cleanups and uh, groundwater cleanup activities in the area, uh, solid waste sites and hazardous waste facilities, and um, an impaired water, bo impaired water body, which is the bay. Uh, regarding potential sea level rise, uh, using current site elevations, this map shows what 24 inches of sea level rise would look like if the site remained unchanged. Using the Ocean Protection Council's 2018 sea level rise guidance, 24 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the mean higher high water level under the medium to high risk aversion, high emission scenario at mid-century. At this level, there is some potential for overtopping on the site as indicated by the red lines along Mulford Point, as well as inundation around the edges of the peninsula, it looks like um, around uh, the existing riffraff areas. And this map shows what 66 inches of sea level rise would look like if uh, the site was to remain unchanged. This roughly corresponds to the mean higher high water level at 2090 in the medium to high risk aversion high emission scenario, as well as the 100 year storm condition at mid-century. In this scenario, a lot of the backland would actually be flooded and much of the marine, marina area, uh, though there are some high points in the middle of the peninsulas here that uh, would remain above water. Uh, so this is from the SFEI Adaptation Atlas, which identifies uh, nature-based adaptation opportunities along the shoreline. Uh, these are areas that are well-suited for interventions or actions that can help both address flooding and provide ecological benefits. Now at the project site, the atlas indicates suitability for eelgrass in the channel, shoreline beach along the outside of Mulford Point, uh, upland tidal marsh, and preparation for upland habitat migration. So here is a summary of the questions in the staff report that we'd like the board to consider in your review. Uh, first, please consider how this project meets the public access objectives provided in BCDC's public access design guidelines. Then, staff has identified some specific questions we'd like to ask the board about the design at this stage. And I'll just quickly read them for you. Um, A, are the different areas of the peninsula designed to ensure that the public spaces feel public and allow for the shoreline to be enjoyed by the greatest number of people? B, what advice can you provide for the phase one park to ensure its success? C, how can the basin become an integral aspect of the redesigned waterfront park? D, how does the project protect and enhance existing visual access to the bay, and are there additional ways for the project to improve visual access? E, how can the project improve connections to the bay from surrounding development and infrastructure? Uh, F, what advice or considerations can you provide for resilience and adaptation of the public access areas? And G, what advice can you provide on the relocation of the boat ramp and water taxi floats in consideration of the adjacent existing fishing activities? So before I introduce the project proponents, uh, does the board have any clarifying questions on the staff introduction? None from me. Any questions from the board? OK. 
Okay. Okay. Hearing none, uh, that was very clear. Thank you. Um, great. So I'll introduce the project team to tell you more about the proposal. Today we have John Hughes with Griffin Structures and Chuck Cardella from Gates and Associates presenting with Kevin Nguyen and Patrick Chan from BKF, Katie Bowman, Avalon Schultz, and Nick Tom from the city of San Leandro, Daniel Schaefer Shore from Gates, and Shay Dively from Myers Nave to answer any questions. So now I'll pass it over to John and Chuck. Now I'll pass it over. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. My name is John Hughes. I work for a company called Griffin Structures. We the, are the project managers hired by the city for this project. Um, we have a presentation for you. Uh, much of it is, uh, I'll go through quickly because it addresses some of what Andrea just uh, spoke to. And uh, we are thrilled to be the first presentation that Andrea had and hopefully we'll, we'll finish with a bang with this one. So. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, as Andrea mentioned, this is the, um, the city of San Leandro site map, just to orient the, the team and the, and the board to the project. Um, and this is a more localized map. Um, we draw attention to the fact that the city really sees this park as, as an integral part of an extension of increasing uh, the, the disadvantaged community and the, the overall community of the city to the bay, and so we really see our park as tied to a whole network of parks throughout the city. We do also have uh, an eye towards the history of this site, and you'll see later that we've done a number of uh, outreach efforts to a variety of folks in the community as well as the Ohlone uh, people and gotten their input uh, into this project because we recognize the importance that their input has for this project. And we recognize that this project has a modern site history where it uh, served as a, uh, uh, an area for uh, oyster um, harvesting. It then became a dump. Uh, it became a, a small board, boat harbor in the 60s and over time has been expanded uh, until um, in 2011, uh, the required dredging to keep it from continually silting uh, was discontinued and the city sought to revitalize this area through introducing um, some private development and, and through that process, as you know, Cal Coast Development uh, was selected to work with the city to create a brand new shoreline development. As we mentioned, as you saw earlier, the site is pretty much one big parking lot. There is a uh, El Torito uh, on the northern portion there, right at the corner, uh, number eight. There is the old um, Blue Dolphin uh, uh, where number nine is shown. As you come around towards the east end of the basin, there is an existing restaurant, Horatio's, that this project does not intend to um, do anything or dislocate that, look, that uh, facility at all. And uh, as uh, further south to um, uh, marina, the Marina Inn, number six, uh, that will also remain. Uh, there's also the Yacht Club, the Spinnaker Yacht Club, number three, an existing um, pier, and then two different boat launches. One is rarely used, number four, and number five is also rarely used, but it's a little more active. Some photos of the existing site, a lot of, uh, a lot of concrete and asphalt out there. <coughs> so as you uh, know, back in 2015, this was the plan that first came before you, um, and then there was this plan that came a year later, not much different. We took into consideration the board's um, comments about massing, about access, about sea level rise. We, uh, we, we, we took it to heart and we worked with the developer to come up with a new plan that really opened up the entire area to the community. And that resulted in a 2017 plan that looks like this. Uh, we, this had not come to uh, your group yet because we utilized this plan to really begin our extensive outreach campaign in 2017. So in 2017, we had two different community meetings in November 1st and December 5th. 
And we heard a number of comments about it, uh, the community wanting it to be welcoming to the, to the greater community, embracing nature, passive activities, full day safety, multi-purpose space, separation of pedestrians and bikes, um, interpretive signage, artwork, water access, uh, lighting for safety and ease, and then communal spaces for exercise. We took that to heart. Uh, we incorporated those comments and came up with another iteration. This iteration takes uh, a number of the uh, items out of the water and, and um, softens a lot of the design from the previous one, less concrete, more naturalized environment, more nature, uh, more passive activities. We took this plan in 2022, uh, just this last summer, and we did an extensive outreach plan. We had uh, mailers sent out. We had flyers handed out at city parks. We had an online email blast as well as postings to our website. Um, then we had downtown farmers markets where we, where we invited folks to attend at multiple locations. And then we held three community meetings uh, in July, one at the Senior Community Center, San Leandro Public Library, and then the Marina Community Center as well as additional pop-ups to gather more interest after that uh, at the Bay Fair Farms Market and the Boys and Girls Club. We created a very extensive database of interested parties and really came back with um, some comments and many of which really were, were consistent with what we, we were heading in the right direction. Again, welcoming to the greater community, embracing nature in the Bay, drought tolerant plants, we heard a lot about that. Uh, local uh, or passive activities. Uh, one of the things that, that we heard a lot about is that we wanted, the community wanted this park to be more conducive to passive, more family-oriented activities and less organized sports activities. Um, again, separation of bikes and pedestrians. And there are three um, historical monuments that um, the community has identified as important, as well as it was identified in the environmental impact report to be preserved. And so we, we gained um, information from the different parties as to where they would like to see some of those locations, um, as well as um, a lot of interest in local artists and culturally sensitive art. And we've had a lot of input and outreach from the local Kaimanu Outrigger Club. They currently use some of the um, vacant land where the future multifamily housing is going to be located. That's where they store their outriggers. And so we've had a lot of engagement really as, as recently as um, Friday talking with them about, about how we can incorporate them into this pro uh, project as well. And so with all of that, this is the plan that we have now. It's in the staff report that you uh, saw earlier. Um, and it we believe it really addresses many, if not all, of the concerns that the, the board has had in the past, as well as what we've heard from the community. Uh, to give you a little perspective, uh, at the north, there is still a, a hotel envisioned, but it's been pulled back uh, outside of the 100-foot band to open access to, to the public for a, a, a public park promenade. That promenade will connect to Marina Boulevard, so there'll be a continuous pedestrian and bicycle access there around the front of the hotel. There's gonna be a restaurant right around the, the corner uh, that will have um, uh, views to the, to the bay as well as an upper deck for, for viewing. Uh, also um, outside of the, the 100 foot band so that the, the park uh, remains uh, uninterrupted. There's gonna be a shared parking lot there as it goes down Mulford Point. That's gonna be accessible to both and shared with both uh, the public as well as the, the hotel operators when they have special events. And then the entire peninsula is, is uh, essentially a park um, open to the public. Uh, we'll dive into a little bit more detail as we go further. Um, the center area there that you see in red is where Horatio's Restaurant and the Marina Inn, those are in, envisioned to remain as is. There's a promenade walk away there as well that will be uninterrupted. And then down to the south, there will be an apartment building um, which uh, to provide a bay trail access around the apartments, we will be relocating the existing boat launch out to the point as you can see uh, out there at the end of Pescador Point. One of the big considerations that the city was very interested in, we heard a lot about in the community, we know you're very interested in, is 
how this project intersects and interacts with the Bay Trail. This is an, uh, uh, an image that shows the current Bay Trail map where you have a on-street um, Bay Trail extension that runs along Monarch Bay, Monarch Bay Drive, as well as the dashed line that shows a planned uh, artery for the, the Bay Trail uh, going out to Mulford Point. This represents what we have envisioned for the execution of that, that plan. We see the Bay Trail coming off of Marina Boulevard, coming uh, from the north around the back side of the hotel. That portion of the Bay Trail will be wider than the normal minimum. Uh, it's envisioned as to serve both as an emergency vehicle access in the case of an emergency. And because of that, as well as because of the, we expect there to be a higher volume of interest, that that will be a, a minimum of 20 feet wide plus the shoulders on either side of decomposed granite. The Bay Trail will then extend along the bay side of Mulford Point, wrap around the corner. You'll see it jogs in a little bit. We do that on purpose because we've, we're envisioning an outlook at the corner for maximizing the views, potentially some uh, exercise activities out there, and, but yet we also want to avoid cyclists or pedestrians coming through where you might have some activity. Um, and then the Bay Trail goes down the point of um, Mulford Point Drive and loops around. We do that deliberately to provide, to maximize views to the bay as you're heading down. And then as you're looping back, you're maximizing views to the basin. So we're giving, we're trying to give the community a, an interesting pathway as they loop around this, this park. And then uh, uh, additionally, which is not shown on the original Bay, bay Trail, uh, map, we're anticipating extending the Bay Trail to the point of Pescador Point and then down around the backside of the multifamily housing. This is the um, vehicular traffic plan. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, um, and if you have questions about that, we can, we can speak to it. But the one thing to note is that we are providing parking down to um, the middle section of the, uh, of the park. We do that on purpose because it's a large area and we want to give people the ability to get relatively close to the park. And the project has a very robust and, uh, plan to address sea level rise. Uh, all the elevations you see here are designed to meet uh, 2070 elevations. So we're trying to exceed the, the bare minimum of 2050 medium level uh, high emissions and, and, and raise the grades to 2070. Um, and then as mitigation measures for covering the years 2070 to 2100, the city has, has, has established a CFD to provide funding for future mitigation efforts uh, at a future date. And now, uh, that's pretty much the, the, the project, the development project as a whole. I'm going to hand it off to Chuck uh, Gardala with Gates to speak more in detail about the park itself. Thank you, John. So as we dive into the park design, um, you know, one of the main factors we were looking at is creating a more sustainable uh, ecological response uh, to that site, which has uh, substantial pavement over it. Um, as John noted, we have the Bay Trail that's running along, along the perimeter um, on, as item one that loops around and connects back to the park. Um, item two was the overlook where we're routing that bay trail around so we're not creating some pedestrian bicycle conflict at that location. Uh, three is our parking lots for vehicles. Uh, item four was our restroom slash maintenance slash storage building uh, that would be located in the center of the park that provides uh, the city uh, the necessary uh, amenities for that space. Uh, item six was a great lawn. Um, that's kind of coming back from some of the input we received from the community uh, providing some recreation opportunities uh, that's not sports related. Uh, item seven is a nod to the cultural and the historic uh, aspects of the Ohlone and the Indian tribes at number seven. Uh, eight was our relocated boat launch and then nine is a kind of a recreational equip equipment rental space that may host kayaks, etc., and paddle boards as well as a restroom. Uh, the images you see on the bottom right, those were the three historic elements that are currently out on site. Uh, one is, I believe, a torpedo. Uh, number two was a uh, oyster bed mosaic. And three was a um, memorial sign. And those are being relocated out onto the project site 
as well as uh, bay trail signage, mile markers, interpretive signs, and then a potential art piece may be located up at that uh, prior overlook at the corner of Mulford Point. Uh, getting into some of the park programming elements, uh, this is just kind of a high level of where the lawn zones are, where our water quality basins are, uh, the overlooks. Uh, we have a overlook at the hotel. Uh, the hotel is specifically designed as well, so everything from the lobby is maintaining a view out over the landscape and outside their patio area and maintaining those views out to the bay. Uh, and we also have one at the Mulford Point corner, the Ohlone Indian Memorial uh, that's on the, towards the point of Mulford, as well as the very bottom point of Mulford. Um, along the apartment side at the corner there at Pescadero Point where the Bay Trail intersects, we also have an additional overlook plaza as well. The uh, just general planting concepts of uh, lawn zones where they would be actually used. Uh, we would try to minimize uh, the use of non-functional lawns. So these are more going to be promoted for recreational opportunities. Um, and then looking at in implementing you know, California native shrubs that are adapted to this specific climate out here. Uh, we do have some winds and coastal influences that we will definitely take into consideration as the project moves into the design process. Uh, for the trees on the plan, uh, we do have, we are trying to maintain as many views as possible. So especially up at the top of Marina uh, Boulevard and along the Bay Trail, uh, minimizing the number of trees on that uh, side. So we're uh, maintaining those view corridors. Um, and then also reinforcing some of those corridors on Mulford and Pescador Point to uh, provide some uh, delineation and focal points. Uh, here we're getting into the blow-ups of the enlargements of some of those uh, specific place spaces. Uh, here we have the enlargement overlook. This is at the hotel uh, facility that uh, Calcos is working on. Um, so our limit of work is really the edge of the Bay Trail. Uh, a different landscape architect uh, is doing the other piece of the hotel. Uh, but we've been uh, collaborating with them of maintaining a very low landscape in here. I believe they are looking on the hotel side of you know, glass view fences. Um, everyone is on board of maintaining that view out from the patio area. Uh, here we see the 26 foot wide uh, EVA zone labeled. And then we, uh, the uh, overlook area here, we're looking at a uh, extended deck system that is going over the water and providing some uh, water access opportunity. Uh, this area would include uh, seating areas, seating elements, uh, bike uh, racks for bicyclists, as well as some uh, guardrails that would per, uh, go around the perimeter. Here as we move down towards the uh, center of Mulford Point, this is the what we'll call the middle parking lot that's uh, shared use. Uh, here you can see the BCDC jurisdiction lines kind of uh, narrowing and pinching the site. Um, we do have sections developed for all of these that were in the original package that uh, we can go into further if needed as well. Um, the intent is to maintain the 18-foot uh, wide bay trail at this point, uh, continuing to the west as we loop down Mulford Point. Uh, we also have the uh, native planting buffers that would be included at the top of the riprap uh, separating the trail system. Here we are at the uh, corner of Mulford Point uh, where that primary overlook is. Um, item number four that you see there on the red line is what we're looking at as the uh, proposed location for a future uh, art opportunity. Uh, that is a, a focal plaza that would provide a location to, you know, for people to go out and watch the sunset and do other items like that. Uh, we also have some uh, berms and landscape areas through here to provide some wind protection as well from uh, users. As we go down further the south point of Mulford Point, uh, this is the lower parking lot where the restroom facility is as number five. Uh, you see some of the items labeled number two, which are our water quality treatment basins. And this is where the looped path, uh, the, the Bay Trail will loop back on itself. Uh, and create that circuitous route uh, for bikers, walkers, joggers, et cetera. Uh, here we're looking at the what we're calling the Great Lawn. 
Uh, this is uh, a non-programmed uh, recreation space, so it is a lawn. Uh, we have looked into some uh, native California native lawn alternatives versus your standard fescue types of grasses. Um, but uh, creating some recreation spaces within this area that allow you to play frisbee, um, you know, have picnics, et cetera. Uh, the cultural overlook is on towards the bottom left uh, that's identified as number five. Uh, and this would be utilizing some natural boulder systems uh, to create and define a space uh, that's disconnected from the main bay trail. Uh, so it allows the, uh, that user group to be uh, a little more left alone from the active hustle and bustle of, that may occur on the trail system. Uh, we have connectivity paths that connect the east and the west of the Bay Trail as well uh, that allows circulation to move uh, easily through the space. And at the bottom here, this is the bottom of Mulford Point, uh, another overlook. We were looking at relocating the, the sign there uh, that's labeled number six um, and placing that at that uh, towards that terminus point as well. Um, again, the Great Lawn is kind of following through and continuing down to this point with some additional landscape berms and boulders within those spaces. At uh, Pescador Point, uh, this is where we have the uh, kayak launch and boat launch. Um, we have the Bay Trail along the top that's running east to west uh, that terminates into a uh, overlook plaza but with the uh, recreation equipment building uh, and restroom facility there. Uh, there's also a memorial sign uh, that's labeled as number eight that would be relocated to that space. Uh, the uh, boat launch number three there is, would be relocated from the prior existing location on the project site that's just south of the apartments. And here, this is just following through the additional parking uh, layout uh, that's immediately adjacent to the apartments where the Bay Trail uh, transitions, will cross the road, and then head south, uh, jogging around the apartment. Uh, there is a connection for pedestrians um, that will connect up to the Horatio site, the existing uh, buildings that are going to remain. And we're also looking at providing a uh, on-street bike lane uh, from that location and connecting up into that space as well. So as uh, Andrea had mentioned earlier, um, the project right now is envisioned to occur in two phases uh, due to funding uh, concerns and um, in an interest to produce and build an environment that the to accelerate the access to this area, to the community. Um, what you see in front of you is the delineation of what we envision as phase one. Uh, it will include the realignment of Mulford Point Drive, which uh, we believe will um, enhance the visual corridor to the, to the park uh, compared to the original or current uh, connect, um, street, which is somewhat serpentine. Um, building out the uh, parking lot and in, 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 um, identified as number two. Uh, we will be building out the Bay Trail component, but you can see that it's a simpler version of the Bay Trail that it essentially uh, extends straight down towards the end of the point, and we'll be utilizing some hydro seed uh, in installations uh, throughout the area. Uh, the design idea here is, is very similar to what uh, occurs at, uh, to the north at, at Oyster Bay where it's a little bit more naturalized, um, but we want to do something to, um, to bring a park to the community as quickly as possible uh, and utilizing the, the funds that are available. Uh, phase one also envisions um, building out the entirety of uh, Pescador Point, so building the new boat launch uh, as well as the rental kiosk um, and, um, and then um, and, and, the, and then the associated parking. The goal here is really to provide access to the water as quickly as possible uh, and provide access to the park as quickly as possible. And so that's one of the reasons why we are building out the, um, the, the, the boat launch and the associated uh, docks first is we want to allow people to bring, you know, human powered craft, paddle boards, kayaks, uh, et cetera, and be able to interact in the basin or out into the bay. And then, um, and this is the goal right now is to start com uh, construction of this phase 
by the second quarter of 2025 uh, and complete it by the uh, third quarter of 2027. And um, something to note, uh, this phase will involve the raising of the grade to address sea level rise mitigation um, levels of 2070. So everything you see in phase one will be raised and will be brought up to the grades necessary to meet those sea level rise goals. Phase two is the full build out of the rest of the development, the hotel, the multifamily housing, and then rebuilding out the park and really bringing in the amenities that, that we just shared with you and enhancing it further as, as funds allow. And that's uh, the late date for that is Q4 of 2031. However, I think our entire team uh, has a goal of doing it much sooner than that, but uh, that is the outside date uh, that has uh, already been negotiated in the development agreement. And that is our presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the next step we'll have here is just clarifying questions. This is not discussion at this point, but for the board to give uh, to have an opportunity to uh, just clarify aspects of what you've just presented. So uh, I think I can't see hands up on the screen. So um, Bob, your hand's gone up. Um, uh, okay, and Tom's hands up, and I'm sure everyone else's hands are up along here too. So um, uh, look, we might uh, just um, uh, Bob. Why don't you go ahead with your question? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the boat launch uh, layout, and you know it looks nice. I think it seems a bit constrained, um, and it's not very detailed. So I'm wondering if um, if the uh, the the people that that do the hand launch have had an opportunity to weigh in, and whether or not there's been any discussion with um, you know, the state parks, uh, Department of Boating and Waterways, or a review of other guidelines. I, it, I just, it almost looks like if you could fill out into the water a little bit, you might have, you know, more space. And I, I, I know that sounds crazy, but um, have, 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 how far along are you on this uh, layout? That's my question, this I guess. About, this is about as far as we are along that we're still on the conceptual level. Yeah. We have, um, as you may or may not be aware, the county uh, fire also utilizes this boat launch, and we have coordinated with them the turnaround radius that they need to be able to access that that space and launch their boats. Um, so we, we have had some coordination with that. And we also um, specifically designed the kiosk to be where it is and the pedestrian paths to be the way they are so that the idea is that if you can see um, – on one of the boat, boat docks that's a little wider, uh, that would be the area where you would potentially store some of the ki um, kayaks or paddle boards. You would pay your, 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 your fee and you'd get a life jacket and then you'd be escorted down the ramp um, to then launch your, your craft. I live in an area, uh, Dana Point, that has a very similar scenario and it, and it, works, uh, it works very well. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Well, thank you for thank you for your answer. I just uh, it, I think it could be a really important element and and uh, might need some more attention. Although maybe not. I don't know. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Tom. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, and I know we talked about this six years ago as well. What attention is has there been to the basin itself, and what attention can there be, given the uh, water line and the water. So we've spent a lot of time looking at the basin and, and trying to figure out the, the highest and best use of it. There was a time, as you saw in the past, where there was going to be some repurposing of docks. There was considered um, some, some uh, fountain-like um, features. Uh, the challenge with this basin is that it is prone to siltation, and that siltation will continue. It, and, and given its orientation and its location, um, and talking with the engineering staff in the city, we've come to the conclusion that the, that the best course of action is to let nature have its way and allow um, human-powered craft to interact in, within the basin, but not to incentivize motorized craft in there, nor are we looking to incentivize swimming in there because of the mudflats and the, uh, you know, it, it will 
Um, the mud flats do, do present themselves twice a day at low tide, and so it's not um, an ideal place for uh, swimming, for example. Uh, that being said, we recognize that it's a, that's an important feature, and so we want to maximize views. We want to maximize the, the beautification of it, and we want to allow for people on human-powered craft, paddle boards, kayaks, et cetera, to be able to go in at high tides you know, um, at their leisure. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask a follow-up. Oh, sorry, Tom. Go, no, go yeah. ahead. Go, go ahead. I'm sure you're going to ask what I was going to ask. Well, I was going to say, have you studied uh, the removal of riprap on the interior basin? Uh, we've t we've looked at it, but we haven't. We don't plan to do it now, simply because we're trying to preserve, you know, any potential erosion. Uh, there's some cost considerations to that. But what we are looking to do is we're we're planning on um, as we raise the grade in the portion uh, that is above where we might be adding some new riprap, especially on the inside basin, we're going to be using certain um, ground cover that we um, I, are, that are designed, if I get this right, Chuck, to to grow into the riprap. And so it'll kind of smooth out the transition from, from rock to, to, to landscape and, and soften that, that edge. Thank you. Tom, was that the, what you wanted to ask? Pretty much. Okay. Thanks, Tom. You're okay, welcome. let's just uh, move uh, along here. Um, Gary. Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, is there a diagram, or can you point out where is the original shoreline? Um, the original uh, Monarch Bay Drive is the Monarch original Bay shoreline. Drive. You mean like like the original original? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What's landfill and what was? Yeah, I believe Monarch Bay Drive is the the true original. Uh, uh -huh. Nick, do you know? Yeah. <laughs> Tom, city engineer for San Leandro. Um, in San Leandro, we commonly uh, refer to the original uh, shoreline as very close to the Union Pacific Railroad. Mm -hmm. Anything west of that was too marshy to build on. The railroad didn't want to go there. So it's quite uh, a distance from where we are today. Mm -hmm. This area has received a lot of fill since, uh, since development has been happening in the Bay Area. So it is, it's, it's way to the east of the Monarch Bay Drive? Yes. Yeah. So really all those, a lot of those homes in the graded uh, neighborhood is, yes. is also on fill. That's yeah. also on fill, for sure. Okay. That golf course, all fill, for okay. sure. Great. So I, I have one more question. I probably, Maybe you're a good person to, uh, to answer. I, I couldn't help noticing in the 2100 sea level rise scenario, I mean, the entire golf course site is completely underwater. And so I'm just, as we review our portion, you know, does it have any role in the mitigation of flooding for those inland sites later? Has that been taken into account? And I know we're not reviewing that neighborhood or Monarch Bay, but, uh, you know, it's hard to kind of think of them completely separately. Uh, indeed, and we have thought of that as well. So the uh, work that we are proposing is largely shown within the limits on this slide. Uh, that work will be uh, raised, the grade will be raised so that uh, water will not cross this project and enter the neighborhood. Just to the north of this project, there is a, a low area where water currently could enter the neighborhood. We don't have any history of it flooding. Um, we have a project to rebuild a, a portion of a levee there, um, maybe it's 200 feet long, and raise that grade. Um, and between these two efforts, we believe that this neighborhood will not see flooding under some sea level rise. So the, just to summarize, the, the single family neighborhood will be raised so that that will form kind of a levee there? Sorry, uh, well, the, the, the new the single new. family residential neighborhood that you see on the screen here will, yes, will be raised, will be built outside of the floodplain. Uh, the existing neighborhood to the uh, east 
will be uh, protected from flooding because the water will not be able to cross the new higher neighborhood. Got it. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, can I just ask a quick follow-up on that? Um, Monarch Drive, is, what is the elevation on Monarch Drive? Is that uh, compatible with, you know, does it provide protection through 2050, or what are the elevations like? Uh, the elevation is probably approximately 10, which okay. is right at the existing base flood elevation currently okay. from FEMA um, without any sea level rise considerations. Uh, we do propose to raise Monarch Bay Drive in front of this project, but uh, outside of the project, it's going to remain as is. Thank you. Um, just following on that line of inquiry, while you're already up here, do you know what elevation you're raising Monarch Bay Drive to? Well, we have our civil engineer here who, who could come in and answer more specifically, but as you can see, where the hotel is, that's going to be raised the single family is going to be raised, so Monarch Bay Drive is going to have to conform to meet those grades. So it will be raised in those areas. However, where Marina Inn is, as well as Horatio's is, those stay e existing. So it is going to have some, some unusual un undulations to meet existing grades. Um, but uh, wherever we are raising grades and Monarch Bay Drive is, uh, is, is con conforming to, we're going to be raising it as well. well maybe let me ask you a different way. Um, the design elevation is for your 2070. Correct. Uh, medium to high risk scenario, is that that's, right? That's right. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. And then I had another question about the um, relocation of the boat launch. And if you guys have looked into it all, wave action, tidal influence in this area, is it a good location for a boat launch? Um, <laughs> Just noting that the existing location is quite protected, and I didn't know if this one shared the same kind of characteristics. Exactly, it does. Um, in fact, we looked a lot. Uh, we, we, in all the calculations that we're looking at with regard to um, grades for sea level rise all take into account wave action and wind waves. And the main reason why we have it oriented the way we do is we want to take advantage of that protection that it currently has by uh, angling it to the south the way that it does. Great. Um, and then another question was, um, are there any ideas about storage facilities for those outrigger canoes here? You were saying that this is a, a good launch for them. Not, yes. Not that you have to, just wondering if you are We are seeking ways to do that. It's a, it's a big challenge. They're very big they're boats, long, yeah. but they're a very strong proponent of the, of the project. The city is very much on board with uh, accommodating them. Right now, the, the best spot that we've identified is if you can see where the boat launch is, there's the wider section. We might extend that and make it a little bit, um, kind of turn it parallel to Pescador Point, make it a little wider, allow them a space where they can store their boats and also have a low freeboard access to launch their boats there. Um, we're still working through that, but we are, we're, we're looking and seeking to come up with solutions that provide them with what they need. We just met with them on Friday and they, they gave us a list of, of their wishes and wants. Um, obviously, there's cost constraints, and we're trying to make this as um, unspecialized as possible. So we're trying to think of ways that we can accommodate their needs while also coming up with solutions that enhance the access to the, to the community for that larger area. And, and, and that plat larger platform may actually serve du dual purposes, um, where that could be an area where you have more um, public access to be able to rent kayaks or boats, or maybe even small sabots, possibly. Um, and then just the last question, um, the parking lots around the existing hotel and Horatio's, are they, are, are there any, is that in the master plan area within this kind of area of work? I know there's some leases there that are existing and you're not planning to relocate those, but I was wondering if, you know, any work in the like sidewalks, pedestrian access kind of things in those parking lots would be possible. Um, we're not envisioning change. You can kind of see, I call it the donut hole. You can kind of see the existing, that area will remain unchanged. There is a nice pathway behind Horatio's and the Marina Inn that will remain uh, open to the public and we're hoping to tie our sidewalks to those so there's a continuous pedestrian access. We are also, because of the realignment of Mulford Point Drive, there's going to be some gradation changes because we're raising grade but they're staying where they are. So there might be some retaining conditions, there might be some slopes, 
We're going to have to do some conform, interesting conforms to, to get access into their parking lot. Um, but we have strategies in place and that we're working through to do that. Um, but currently, we don't plan on really redeveloping those areas, and I think the city is still in the process of negotiating those, those future leases. Okay. Sorry, I actually just have one more question. Yeah. Um, the, the little observation deck that's in the lagoon, or it looks like basin, right. whatever we're Right behind that, the restaurant at Horatio. Is that planned to stay or no? That'll, that'll come out. Okay. So all, in all fill that's currently in the, in the basin is, is intended to come out. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a clarifying question to follow up on Kristen. Um, the public access that's on the west side of the existing hotel and Horatio's, mm -hmm. that's, that will remain at its existing elevation. Correct. The new um, public access that parallels Mulholland Point Drive will come in at the new 2070 height condition at Mulford Point Drive yeah yes yeah and then in and that's in phase one correct and then in phase two Monarch Bay Drive will actually be raised for the frontage of the project correct but the hotel and the Horatio's will stay where they at are at their existing elevation correct okay so the this project does not resolve the resiliency issue for Horatio's and the hotel? Presently, we don't intend to design something as part of this project. What we're looking to do, though, is the city is establishing a community facilities district to provide funding. So, you know, depending on how the lease negotiations go with those current establishments, if the city needs to take further action to provide resiliency, uh, for the future, they're, uh, they're working to establish funding to do that. That's great. Um, and then just to clarify, when the elevation is raised on the, um, on the basin, I'll call it the basin frontage, uh -huh. is what the shoreline profile, does it continue to be a riprap edge on the interior of that? No. Um, you can kind of can see you describe here, that I, a little bit? I could, I could probably, if I can. Oh, I might confuse everybody. I have some backup slides that show sections there. Um, let's see if I can pull this off. Oh, here we go, backup. Uh, I'm just going to go really fast so I okay, don't, thank you. don't get dizzy. These are all the shoreline project slides. This is all in your packet. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, this is... Um, yeah, that's that's a good. Okay, I mean, this is this is pretty consistent across. Okay, um, oh, you can see the legend there. This is right at the corner. Um, actually, I'm going to go to one that shows the the inside basin. So you can see there uh, to the right um, where we raise the grade. We're going to be putting some additional riprap, but we're also going to be landscaping it so that we soften that edge. We don't want to bring a bunch of rock right up to the pedestrian access. So, so we want to take advantage of this new grading that we're doing and, and soften that edge. Um, but we do envision some riprap just for stability. And so that's consistent uh, through a lot of the sections. So this is, um, this is running through um, Pescador Point. You can see um, that along the pedestrian side, we're going to be landscaping that edge um, but right up to the landscape to soften that. Thank you for that clarification. I just have one more uh, question. One, one, uh, one quick question. Oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Tom, go ahead. <laughs> um, the, uh, the parking that is shown in the, in the park, 150 spaces, uh, how, how was that number determined? Ba was it based on the usage or something else? And then second part of that question is the, the water quality basins that I'm seeing within the park, is that basically C3 for all the new impervious services or within the park itself or anything else? So the, the water quality basins is really to achieve um, WQMP requirements to capture and recharge the, the water table. Um, and those are located throughout. I think we have uh, an extensive, I, I think we're, we have more than we need. Yeah, a lot. Um, and then um, 
as it relates to parking, I believe that the parking for the shared parking lot was part of the negotiations with CalCoast in terms of what they need and what we could fit. We're trying to write to kind of strike the right balance between providing the sufficient parking that we need for the community while providing as much natural um, greening of the environment uh, of the area as possible. I can say that the that the the parking that's established for the Pescador Point has been closely coordinated with the county fire department so that they have their own special spaces and it's also designed to be able to accommodate a, um, a truck and trailer um, so that the, the boaters can have a place to park and and so we've we've thought a lot about that uh, as well how much of that uh, parking by the restaurant is going to be used by the restaurant or i don't quite understand how that works well i believe the parking of the restaurant is going to be part of your parking lot it's overflow. So the, yeah, the, the, the shared parking lot is really overflow parking uh, for special events. The, 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 the developer is charged with providing sufficient parking for their amenities in their zone. Inside their parcel, okay. Yeah, exactly. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back a slide so you guys can have a right view. Tom, have you finished? I I asked the questions that I had, yeah. Okay, thanks. Kristen, you have your hands up, you're okay? Okay, look, I just have two uh, final questions, uh, clarifying questions. Phase one shows a very large area of hydro seeding. Right. Uh, what is the irrigation plan for that? We haven't worked it out yet, but we do intend to irrigate that. Um, okay. I'm not sure if it'll be, you know, just over, you know, over, Gray over over top, probably. Landscape architect. Yeah, we would typically do a uh, spray type irrigation for to establish the hydro seed uh, for that area, and it really depends on the time of year of that establishment. And the hydro seed is is a grass, right? It would be is a grass, a low grass. Yeah. Um, okay. And we we would look to work with a um, grass special, seed specialist for an adapted, low water use type of material. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can we, can we look at that hydro seed plan, where, where it's marked Phase out, one. which yes. which areas? Yeah, yeah, that entire thing. That yeah. entire area. Yeah. As you can imagine, the, the 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 cost of getting it to this stage is almost three quarters of the of the budget that we have. And so, working with the the financial constraints that we have, we're trying to provide the, as much of an amenity as possible, as quickly as possible, rather than waiting till the entire project is built out. And that's that's the that's the the logic between. The, behind phase one. Right, and all of the existing trees will be removed because- Because we're raising the grade. Right. Exactly. Okay, Okay. thank you. And the, the second question is the cultural interpretation area on the plan. I just wasn't, it wasn't clear to me whether the Ohlone uh, recognition plus the memorial to the two vessels lost to sea plus the other things you had in the pictures, do they all go into that area or are they no. distributed? No, in our conversations with the Ohlone, uh, they specifically asked if they could have an, a, a, a special area for ceremonies um, and other you know, culturally sensitive things. Um, and that was why we picked that site specifically for that. It won't be quarantined off, so the public will still have access to it too. It'll be a private place of contemplation for the entire community, but it'll be designed around and in the interest of uh, the request from the Ohlone. The other memorials will be placed throughout the park. We met with the Lost Boat Memorial Society and asked them their thoughts about where to put the, the torpedo, uh, which will be directly adjacent to the parking lot. They even told us which way to orient it and how to fly the flag. And I mean, they're very specific and we, we're gonna accommodate their, their wishes. And then um, there's the Jack T. Maltester Memorial plaque, which is really just a commemoration of the, the marina that is since that will then have been gone by then. Um, that's going to stay roughly in the same location. And then the, um, the Oyster Bay mosaic is going to stay roughly towards the point there um, uh, at the end of Mulford Point. But we haven't nailed down exactly where it is. But we, we asked uh, the community their thoughts about it. And for the most part, they didn't have strong opinions where it was. They just uh, wanted it in a place that was relatively convenient but not necessarily too prominent because they, they wanted to have more views of the, of the, of the, of the bay and, and nature, et cetera. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think that concludes our clarifying questions. Thank so you. I appreciate those answers. Uh, so now we'll go to uh, public uh, comment. And uh, so we're opening up the meeting for public comment. Any member of the public who's attending the meeting in person, please notify the board secretary if you'd like to make a comment. Um, if you're attending online and would like to make a public comment, uh, please raise your virtual hand to speak. I'm just going to pause now before I read the instructions again. Um, are there hands raised for public comment? There's no public comment. Okay. We did receive an emailed public comment, correct, Andrea? Uh, correct. The BTRO provided um, a comment that I can um, uh, briefly summarize. Um, so the, the BTRAIL project submitted a comment via email, which I've shared with both board members and project proponents ahead of time. Um, first comment is about the width of the bay trail. Um, you know, the minimum is 18 feet wide, but they're suggesting that in many instances, uh, a wider section uh, would be required. And given the um, potential high levels of use in this area, they're requesting a wider trail width be considered. Um, the second comment is um, about the existing trails in front of Horatio's and the Marina Inn, um, extending all the way uh, to the boat ramp on the southeastern side. Um, they said that incorporating um, improvements to these um, would, should be considered um, as part of the larger improvements um, because these are um, like key waterfront trails um, that connect the site um, and around the site. Uh, they also mentioned that this could be designated as part of the Bay Trail and used by both um, cyclists and pedestrians. The third comment um, proposes that the additional pedestrian pathways that would connect the Bay Trail to the edge of Mulford Point um, could provide access for both bicyclists and pedestrians on the pathways, not just pedestrians. Um, so basically, it's, it's a comment about providing provisions for all Bay Trail design users. Um, and then the fourth comment is about requesting additional information about the Bay Trail along Monarch Drive and how that will be up, upgraded and what the width and treatment of that at um, Pescador Point intersection would look like. And then um, they're also asking for um, the Bay Trail segments to be completed during phase one and not the final phase. Um, and they would like to hear more about the project plans to provide adequate and un uninterrupted access to the Bay Trail throughout the project phases. Um, and I think perhaps in this last comment, they're asking specifically for the inclusion of the Bay Trail running along the north northwest corner um, of Mulford Point back to the corner of uh, Monarch Bay Drive and Marina Boulevard. So, Andrea, you're saying that they want to see the loose form of the trail, is that correct? In phase one. In phase one. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so So that concludes the public comment uh, agenda item. So now we move to board discussion and advice. So, uh, if, uh, so this is the time where the board discusses the proposal. And so I'd ask everyone except board members to turn off their cameras so the board can focus on the discussion. And um, board members, remember to turn your microphone on when you speak. And uh, we have... Of course, we have uh, a series of questions. I'll just go back to those um, uh, as a reminder for everyone. Uh, we were asked to consider, uh, and you've got these written down, so I got, won't go through them in detail, but A through G and um, A about making spaces feel as public as possible, B um, making sure that Phase one is 
successful and can it be made more successful? Um, how does the basin become integral with the design? Uh, how does the project uh, protect and enhance visual access? Uh, connections to the bay from surrounding development is the next point. And the last two, uh, really dealing with um, considerations in relation to resilience and adaptation, park access, and um, comments and thoughts on the relocation of the boat ramp and the water taxi float, uh, given the adjacent fishing activities. So there's a series of points there that I think we should consider as we, as we discuss uh, the project. And look, I'm, I'm just going to start with some reflections. I know uh, Tom, Gary, and myself, um, I'm not sure. Uh, were, you, did, were you present as well? At, yes, you were, of course, yes. So, you know, most of the board who's here tonight actually was present for the earlier iterations of the, the uh, project. So, you know, I think big picture, there's clearly a substantial change and a great deal of work that's been done, a great deal of work with the community. So I want to commend everyone associated with the project with the work you've done in the last six years. And uh, there's, um, you know, in terms of what we asked you to focus on, I think there's been some uh, strong response to that. So I want to thank you for that. Um, but, uh, you know, as always, there's, uh, after six years, I think, uh, a lot of things have changed, particularly in the resiliency area and adaptation area. I think six years ago, that was not always the first thing that we talked about, although we did for this project because of the vulnerability of, uh, you know, of, the, um, of the area. But uh, it's good to see that there's been uh, thought given to those aspects as well. So with that, I'd like to um, just... Uh, have the discussion lead off. I don't know that we, I'll just go through as we're talking and try and point us back to um, the park and phase one and some of these other A to G comments. We want to make sure that we've covered those uh, at the end. So look, I think we might just uh, lead off. I think, I think it would be valuable for uh, the discussion to maybe just start with people's reactions to um, the new plan that we're seeing today versus what we had seen before. Um, and I would, and I think we should really focus in on phase one as well and uh, make some uh, feedback on that, just maybe to kick off the um, discussion. And I, I think we should focus on the basin as well. So uh, having said that, would someone like to start? Who would like to kick off? Um, Tom? Why don't you? You've got your hand up. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, several things seem to interlink here in my mind, um, beginning with the fact that I feel like the park is over over parked. I don't think 150 cars are really necessary, um, and it's bringing vehicles too far out into the into the park itself. Um, and I think that there's too much uniform use of lawn. Now, there's a kind of a consistent idea about this park from one end to the other, that there's, it's kind of lawns framed by other stuff, berms or, or some planting, things like that. And this is, the parking is to provide access for all these, all these areas uniformly. And I, I guess I disagree with the uniformity of it. I feel like the parking ought to be confined much more over by the, uh, restaurant and I don't I think it just seems like too much parking there the kind of the hub the ending piece for turnaround should be somewhere in the middle of that parking lot and then as you move around to the to the west edge um, I think that the there could be some zoning you could become more and more uh, uh, ecological more and more uh, natural system based and less kind of like lawns with barbecues and stuff that we, well, we need all that stuff too. And then third, I feel like there, there's a topographic potential here that's not getting exploited. We have tremendous wind, of course, off the bay. And wouldn't there be some benefit in having a real system of, of, of uh, berms on the west edge, which would shelter people uh, and that as you, and then on the on the inboard side facing onto the basin, 
um, there could be more more sheltered areas for use. Um, and like I said, then these things could become more, as you get further down the peninsula, there's less people penetrating, more possibilities for habitat, uh, more dominated by natural systems. And then the last thing is that if you had a cross section where there was an elevated series of berms along the, uh, the west edge, although not, not blocking all views, that the topography could step toward the basin and maybe consider, do we need to keep this riprap on the inboard side? I mean, how, how much wave action is there really going on there? Could that soften up? Could it tear us down? Could, and could, this, uh, could there be an approach to the basin that really uh, banks on that? In other words, what, what is this? It, we've got to know what the future life of the basin is going to be, I think. And, the, and are there ways that we could kind of move things along? I don't think just letting nature take its course is going to be a very pleasant outcome. It's going to just silt up like every, some of these ones I've seen in Sonoma, it's just, it's just a kind of big pancake of mud. And could we work with the, the way that the, the water is being uh, organized through terracing and establishing more wetlands, more areas that might actually, uh, in my mind, get rid of the, the, the riprap on the inboard side and work that edge into something much softer and more uh, natural system based. And I'd love to know what Bob thinks about all that. So sorry, too many comments. I, I got kind of excited about what you were saying, Tom. So if can I can I jump in and say something? Please. Yeah. <laughs> thank thank you, Jacinta. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was trying to figure that out too, and I and the inf the information we ha in terms of what what's going to happen in the future, and you know we've seen places like up in Bahia, in Nevada, where uh, the sedimentation is has been. Um, so extensive that you actually get vegetated marsh plain that that the the uh, site aggrades up to higher high tide, and and actually have some clapper rail or, um, there's a new name for it I, I can't remember but, um, anyway the uh, and so it would be good to know if it's likely to remain as a mud flat and to what elevation, or if it's gonna reach high enough that, that cord grass and then pickleweed could establish and which could be really beautiful. But in that sense, one of the things that's missing ecologically is a transition to higher elevations for high tide refuge and, and kind of more of an ecotone and, and, and a broader um, ecological opportunity. So I would suggest it might even be worth filling that uh, area a little bit here and there, maybe even creating some islands for birds uh, away from, you know, cats and other domestic, uh, I don't know. I, I, but I think it would be good to get an ecologist on board to see if, if that could be uh, really enhanced. And then I think, Tom, where you were going with that is maybe then you design around that too. Like, you know, that's part of the, of the whole thing. Anyway, so it's, I'll, I'll be quiet now. I think it, I think it create a lot of value. That's I think it's my I think it's just a missed opportunity that shouldn't keep getting missed. Yeah, what they would need to do I think is look at the suspended sediment concentrations and do a projection of vertical accretion and um, sea levels going a little slower than people anticipated right now. So it's possible that they could get up. Uh, I'm not sure, but possible that they could get up to uh, marsh. Uh, emergent vegetation elevations, in which point then you get the organic root mass, and then you might be able to keep up with sea level rise for quite a while. And then the um, transitional habitat, you know, going upland a little bit uh, and providing accommodation space with sea level rise could be really exciting. But even without all that, you could fill some of it and create some of that um, rather than just having a square. Uh, mud flat. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's a good deep dive uh, into those issues. Um, I think we really want to keep an eye on all of the areas that we want to cover, in particularly access, if uh, anyone can uh, address that as well, um, and phase one. So uh, let's keep going. Great discussion. Kristen. Access, my favorite. Um, 
Well, I just want to say thanks so much for all of the background, and I also really appreciate all of the background on community engagement process and how it shaped the plan. Uh, that was really helpful. Um, I also think you know it's helpful to see that you guys are thinking about the amazing views from this site and showed some of the ways that you're kind of planning for that. Um, also, I think it's really great that you're including restrooms. You know, it's so important for people to enjoy parks and stay there to be able to use the restrooms. And I was just out there this morning and used the restroom while I was visiting. So, um, thanks for the, these kind of simple things, but they're so helpful for people. Um, I just also want to say, you know, the things like the overlook plazas at the corners, um, those are great places for people to kind of step out of the way as cyclists come by on the path. So noticing some of those little design moments that you're thinking about kind of, I, I don't know if you were thinking about them as Bay Trail pedestrian interaction, but that is really helpful, I think, for those corners. Um, I, before I talk about access, I also just wanted to say one thing, which I think we should call this the lagoon or something instead of the basin. And I think, you know, it's, um, it's actually these places where you can kind of see the water and see across the water and see something really interesting across it are really unique opportunities that you don't see a lot of. A lot of our Bay Edge is just this kind of, you're next to the Bay and it's very far until you see it's these distant views. But these places where you can see something happening right next to you in the water is a really kind of special, cool moment. And I think it is sad to be removing so much water access. I mean, these docks are like provide so much access, but it, to be removing that, you know, it, there's also this special opportunity of this place, like different kind of access, like, you know, kayaks and sups and, and those kinds of things. There's a beach up in Sausalito that's kind of sheltered and kids love to sup there. It's much safer, it's calm. Um, you could think about uh, maybe keeping a few of the docks to be able to do that in this basin. Um, maybe invite the sea lions to come onto some of the docks and take a look at those, or you know, maybe some shorebird kind of mud flats. In, uh, I used to live in Sydney and they have a floating movie projector where they project movies and you can sit on the lawn and watch look out and watch the movies so just opportunities to think about this as a that that water sheet as a space of activation i think is um it's a special opportunity of the site that would really add a lot of value to the surrounding development also and the kind of identity of this this development um okay so now on to access um so this is in an area of high social vulnerability and that includes households without vehicles and you actually have to go quite a ways, I think, from the surrounding neighborhood to get to the waterfront stuff, the parks. There's a lot of parking lots to cross. Um, and especially with this, uh, you know, there's the opportunity with this new housing development to create access ways through that neighborhood. And so just looking at things like, could you create connections at the stub end of, I think it's um, west, Ave 133rd and West Ave 134th. Could those be connections from the neighborhood that could get you to the waterfront more directly rather than having this, um, you know, golf course, which now kind of cuts them off? Um, in order to do that, too, I think there should be um, a lot better and more frequent opportunities to cross Monarch Bay Drive for the residents who are going to be living here in this new community as well as the others in the area. So like right now, it looks like there's only two places to cross Monarch Bay Drive. It's quite a long distance. Um, and, you know, I would say rule of thumb, at least every 500 feet, if not more frequently, some sort of crossing for pedestrians. You could see one at Mulford Point Drive being a good location at the, below, whatever that street below Pescador Point Drive is, maybe that's Pescador Point Drive South, um, making sure there's opportunities to safely cross. And then um, also, I sort of hinted at this in the questions, but uh, getting through the parking lots um, for the existing Horatios and um, the hotel, there's no real kind of pedestrian sidewalks anywhere. It's just a lot of uh, parking, parking lots with islands, but no real kind of safe pedestrian routes. Um, and then also I was looking at the San Leandro bike master plan, and it looks like they've identified Monarch Bay Drive as a class one bike facility, which is a shared use path. And it looks like you have that on the um, 
east side of Monarch Bay Drive. Um, and so again, just making sure that there's safe crossings to get across the drive there without having to go too far from that path to the waterfront. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. That's all? Yeah, I just, um, maybe something to add to that, just in the spirit of the short-term access and some of the comments that came from um, the Bay Trail. Um, I think under, understanding that we sort of don't know, there's the, that we, we don't know when phase two is gonna happen and to what extent it sort of would happen. Um, so this sort of argument for including some of the um, primary public access ensuring that's in phase one, I think is sort of a, a useful thing to think about. Um, one thought about that too is just thinking about that um, these new public access ways are being built at higher elevation with the expectation that the, when the site redevelops, they also will sort of come up to sort of meet that grade. Um, but that's only done on one side um, and um, I can understand that Monarch Bay Drive is expensive and sort of it's a stretch to um, put that into phase one. Um, but I wonder if you can actually build the public access on the west side of Monarch Bay Drive instead of um, giving um, shoreline Bay Trail users uh, an unnecessary need to cross the street from the west to the east, back to the west, um, as they're traveling in that direction, and could you actually build um, a cost one path on the west side that actually would be at the new elevation to meet the east-west spurs, um, and um, basically uh, set up a front door for that development would be future development along Monarch Bay would actually need to be at, and if that actually could be handled. Um, the railway may not be sufficient there, but there's just a lot of parking there on the west side that maybe could be used because, um, to some degree. So um, that could sort of give you a public framework that would um, provide an opportunity um, for a continuous loop um, on the west side of Monarch Bay um, that sort of might be used kind of meet what the Bay Trail is um, trying to describe. Um, and then I would just, that one second, Tom's note that I think I'm concerned about sort of a long stretch of riprap being sort of the best way to um, access the public shoreline um, in all locations. And if the basin or lagoon is the opportunity to um, change to a different profile, which would just allow folks to get closer to the bay, um, I would be very supportive of that. Yeah, I was I was wondering if the, you know maybe in the um, in the proponents' comments at the end. I mean, I would be interested to know uh, what is the city's constraints and goals. You know, like what are the real drivers of the project? Because I think you know a lot of interesting ideas have been mentioned here, and maybe they're just completely off the table for reasons we don't we don't know about. Because I, <clears throat> you know, the idea of um, you know having a green marsh, you know, on the site. Seems like it would have so many benefits, you know, aesthetically that it would really feed the businesses and it would bring people here, and it might also offer some resilience to the area, which is inevitably going to have flood issues later on. Um, so that's a much bigger project, but I think for me, especially because <clears throat> there's um, privately owned uh, homes and condominiums, that those are really hundred-year buildings, probably or maybe more, you know, than should the board, I'm asking all of you, be thinking about 100-year solutions? You know, does that does that mean that we we should be looking at more holistic, longer-term solutions for a property like this, where you could really do something to protect those homes, you know, for the future? Even though we're not reviewing these homes, we're reviewing something which is going to be, which is going to need to come into play in the future to protect those homes. So, <clears throat> if you build those homes now, it's it seems like it almost ensures, you know, some kind of a levy response, you know, maybe maybe later. So when I look at the project short term, 
um, I really have a lot of appreciation for all you've done, for the resolution that's here, all the things that people have mentioned. I think the park and the open space, I don't have any issues with that. I think it, pro it really provides a very important amenity for the, for the neighborhood, and I want to acknowledge that. But I also feel like it's kind of setting up a much bigger, longer-term problem that, you know, is very hard for all of us to think about. Um, and maybe there is no immediate solution, but it kind of kicks the can down the road. And, you know, I think when the expense comes up later for a larger solution, it's going to be much harder to, to deal with. Um, so that that's basically the comment. A couple other uh, little things. I, You know, the access, I think that the, the auto access is kind of funneled into the um, hotel and the apartment building where the access access to the shoreline seems like it's a little more discreet, and I wonder if there could be, you know, maybe, I, I'm not sure I'm fully informed on this, but maybe there's a better marker for the, for Mulford Point Drive to get people directly out to the water. And <clears throat> on the issue of the phase one, uh, what could make it more successful? That is a very, very large area of hydro seeding, and while it's really inexpensive, it's rarely uh, very successful because, um, you know, you really need rainfall to, to have hydro seeding, dependable rainfall to have hydro seeding be uh, dependable, and we don't really have that so much anymore. And then you also have issues of if you do get a lot of rain, you get erosion, you have birds coming and eating all the seeds. And then once, um, let's say, if everything goes perfect, it's not really a permanent solution. It's really just a kind of a short-term erosion control before the kind of weeds and, you know, whatever grows there takes over. I, I would say, is it possible, instead of the hydro seed, to um, do uh, a restoration-type strategy where you get some, some type of native or very tough uh, southwestern uh, grass and have a contract grown in plugs, you know, where you have, like, the little tubes that are, like, an inch wide and, you know, six, eight inches deep? and you literally core them into the ground so that they have the ability to stay cool, moist, uh, over the dry season while they're getting established. And, you know, putting in, you know, a few thousand of those plugs, you know, it, it probably can't compete with hydro seeding, but I think that it is much more likely to have a, you know, a, a more durable effect. So I think hydro seeding is, I don't know, Tom, maybe others want to comment, but I think hydro seeding is is um, is really hard uh, to do. Yeah, I would second that. I mean, I think what you've just said is very important, and I think uh, I'll just use that as a segue to make a couple of comments about phase one because uh, it's very exciting to have phase one of a park, but if what's there. Uh, there's no resemblance to what people are imagining that park might be one day. It might be extremely disappointing for the community. And, and so you know, it makes you wonder, it makes you really evaluate, um, does it make sense to, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's tied to the type of contract and cost efficiency and so on, but if you remove everything, from what's there at the moment. All the trees, the objects that people go and look at, the you know, tables and chairs and benches and all of the things that make people enjoy the space at the moment. Even though there's a lot of asphalt, there are spots where people can enjoy um, the environment. So I, I think it's a very challenging question to look at that area, hydro seeded with no shade, and the likelihood that that hydro seeding will fail, even if it is irrigated temporarily, uh, you know, that may just look like it's an area that's on on hold, basically, you know, um, just really of no appeal. I mean, at least at the moment, when I was out there on <laughs> Saturday, there must have been at least 50 cars spaced out in these large parking lots with people rainy weather, but people were just sitting in their cars enjoying the view. And if you look at what phase one might actually be like, the people can't even 
access the areas the way they can at the moment. So it could be a diminishment of, you know, of uh, people's experience. So uh, given that you are going to be raising the grade through there as part of phase one, uh, you know, it's clearly problematic, but uh, is there some way maybe where you consider a sub phase where you keep even a zone at the tip of the area or a zone more inland, which is treated a little better? I know this comes down to cost management against all the work that's going to be done, but, you know, can you give people in some area of that large park um, a real park for them to use, which may be part of the existing park that gets listed later on or part of the future park that's delivered uh, earlier. Because if you imagine, it's a, it's a big area, and you imagine no trees, you know, that one path, uh, nothing else there, it, 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 it doesn't seem very attractive. So, I, and I, I don't want, to, having put all this work into it, you've done such an incredible job, I just don't want you to have a setback. Uh, with the construction of phase one. Um, so that's uh, the first comment. The second comment, I would just want to pick up on access. Kristen, the points you were making were, I think, really uh, important points because if you look at the, uh, the way the golf course has changed to looks like a par three course now um, with the housing alongside it, that you have to ask the question, long term, does the golf remain a land use there or long term, does that become more housing potentially? And I don't know what the answer is to that or maybe it becomes more of the butterfly habitat um, or maybe it's a critical facility that will always be there. But if you were thinking about a larger master plan from an access standpoint, providing some cut throughs in the housing that you've set out there that might anticipate a long term change of land use from the golf course uh, to other uses, it would be a very, just even for you all internally, just to you know trace out what potential connections could be made back into the housing areas that might create a more of a, a, a sort of a cut through and uh, more connected way of people accessing um, these, what will become incredible uh, you know, amenities on the, on the shore. For sure. I also think you've got a really unique experience here, and I know you all know this because you've been living this project. But uh, when you stand out on the, the, the existing tip, and you would experience this today too, the exposure to the bay is, is very dramatic. Um, and then to basically turn around and then walk 30 or 40 feet, and then you have this calm inland basin. Uh, is a very unusual thing to be able to experience that um, duality of experience in a very um, confined area. So I think the question of the basin long term, I'm not going to repeat the comments that Tom made and Bob and others have commented on, but I think putting that into your thinking, you know, do you have to put any riprap, additional riprap on the inland basin, get that you know, maybe factor that in. Maybe you save money by not putting the riprap, putting the natural edge down there, uh, and even ultimately taking out some of the riprap. I don't know if you could move some of that riprap to the outside edge and, you know, save money. You know, but there may, may be some ways to look creatively at the whole question of riprap. And uh, because that interior basin is not subject to the same weather conditions that the outer edge is. So I, I would try and look at a master plan for riprap and see what you can come up with to, to enhance the ecological uh, opportunities within the basin as a result of that. Um, now I'm just looking at all the other things, the excellent questions staff wanted us to. Jacinda, could, could I just jump in real quick on your comment about the riprap? Yeah, I, re I really like that comment, especially on the marina side. <clears throat> you know, there it might be instructive for folks to go look at the Marina Bay Peninsula up in Richmond. And I was I I worked on that project about twenty something years ago, and uh, thirty years ago. And um, it's nice, uh, but um, 
the rock ripper has a lot of ground squirrels in it and a lot i mean they're really big and fat and ground squirrels you know and then the the green lawns have these geese in, in a couple of places and the geese just kind of take over and they you know they leave things that are not great for people <laughs> behind um and <clears throat> so it might be instructive to look at, at, at that as, as, you know, and I know the East Bay Regional Park District, when I've worked with them, sometimes they, they, they don't like the uh, rock riprap to go up above um, at, at uh, high tide, because that's where the ground squirrels go. So they, they, you know, so there's some things that could be done, I think, on that basin side that might be better for people as well as the environment it might actually cost less, like you, I think is what you were saying. It might be a, a, a Anyway, so I just wanted to echo with that. Thanks. I appreciate that, Bob. You're the expert in all these issues. Um, so, look, I, I think we've uh, covered, I'm just looking at these, all these questions, have we left out anything? Um, the last point, uh, the relocation of the boat ramp and water taxi float in consideration of the adjacent existing fishing activities, I don't have a comment on that. Did anyone else have a reaction to that comment? Or that? I'm having a hard time hearing. What was the question, Jacinta? Yeah, look, it was uh, question G that the staff were asking us to provide advice on the relocation of the boat ramp and water taxi flow. Oh, I have, some I have some thoughts. Yeah, OK, great. You know, I, and I kind of hinted to these I like that they're including um, water access. It, it does seem limited to, to just the hand launched boats and, and not so much for people, which is, you know, Tom had, had brought that up, but, but for the, um, it seemed constrained to me. There's, for example, I recall there's a water quality kind of vegetation area between the trailer parking and, and, and the ramp. And I can just imagine somebody really wanting to just spray down their, their boat or, or, you know, lay something out, you know, and, um, and then uh, getting into those trailer spots and backing in and out of them. And with the turnaround, it just looked very constrained to, you know, it, it kind of depends on how big a trailer we're talking about and all that. But I, I really kind of looked at that thinking, this is great, but, Boy, if they could just widen it and fill into some, you know, into the, I don't know. And, and uh, so I, I would appreciate it if they would take a, a harder look at that and see if there's something, because it may just get overwhelmed. You know, I can imagine cars lining up, you know, if there's more than two trying to get their boats out, they're just going to get stuck probably. I don't know. Um, so that, that was my comment. I, I don't, necessarily dislike what they have, but I thought it could be bigger on the land side. And then also, it seemed like it, there could be more dock space uh, on the water side uh, for for folks to um, tie up and go ashore, you know, like a transient day use dock or something. I don't know. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Okay, we've any other comments of in the discussion stage? I just had a few more things that I wanted to just sort of underline, which were, you know, we've seen single family homes in uh, 2070 floodplain, 2070 and beyond floodplain. And I just wanted to say, Tom, to your question, I, on other projects, we have said that that is potentially very problematic to have um, single family homes in, in that uh, soon of a timeline to be uh, flooded by sea level rise. I don't know what the answer to that is, but um, the other the other thought that I had, which was separate from that, is that we um, Stefan mentioned the possibility of moving the Bay Trail from the east side to the west side. I think another really good reason to move the Bay Trail from the east side of Monarch Bay Drive to the west is there's so many frequent uh, crossings of that potential bay trail by those driveways for the townhomes, that it would really be creating uh, a lot of conflicts for cyclists as they ride along that path. 
And if you move it to the other side, you can have much more like safely controlled intersections. I do wonder, I think if we see this project again, I would like to understand the section of Monarch Bay Drive and how that grade change would work between uh, Mulford Point Drive and Pescador Point Drive with the kind of really significant potential grade change there um, uh, with access between the street and the parking lot potentially. So. Um. Hey, Kristen, could I could I jump in on something you were saying? Um, that, so, when I first looked at those uh, overlooks um, and and the the trail coming right up next to them, it made me a little uncomfortable because, you know, I'm not a landscape designer, but it, it just seems like if somebody was riding their bicycle, they could just swerve right onto the. Oh into the overlook because it all seemed like it was the same elevation and i just thought there it might be good to have a grade separation there or some sort of access separation uh just to keep the bikes off and to, i don't know um uh, other people on the board are probably better uh to they should correct me uh if i'm giving bad advice i'd appreciate it um the other thing that occurred to me, though, along the same lines is that you could build in adaptive capacity by raising those platforms a little bit so that they're a little higher up that can accommodate more sea level rise and, and not have the, the wave run up lap up under the, you know, hit the soffit of the deck. And uh, it might be easier just to build them a couple of feet higher now it might be nice. I did hear that there was a, a concern about views from the new hotel. And so that could be a uh, obviously, a, a something that would would be counter to what I my initial thought was. But my initial thought was to raise those platforms. You can put piles in anyway. Making them three feet higher might be nicer. Uh, and it, I don't know that it really costs you anything. That's good. Look, I'm sorry. I'm just uh, looking at these questions. I think we've given uh, pretty good feedback on the questions, particularly from access and phase one and overall comments. So I, I think those uh, responses are strong. Um, yeah. You know, one thing that the proponents have mentioned was the that the city is establishing this fund to be able to build greater resiliency uh, after 2070. So, or you know, once that's needed. So that's that's good to hear. I actually don't think we've heard that from a city before. So that's very encouraging to see a city looking ahead and planning to, you know, planning ways in which they can fund these um, necessary improvements. So I appreciate that. Um, okay. From a staff standpoint, have we addressed the questions that adequately? I think one of the areas that we were also looking for feedback on was the um, intersection between the hotel and the Bay Trail. Mm -hmm. um, and any advice on how those two interact? Mm -hmm. A cross section, or do we have a section in that area? I think there was one in the package. Let's see. Thoughts on this? If you guys are looking at something, I can't see it. 
by looking at a section or? Yeah, well, yes, we are. We're looking at uh, the hotel overlook section. Oh. Oh, I see it there. What was the question? Uh, for the staff, we're looking for advice on whether the transition from the hotel uh, across this area is, you know, are there ways this could be improved? Yeah, so that was my prior comment is I, I my when I looked at this, I thought the overlook should be raised and there should be a grade separation between the trail and the overlook just because I was thinking of bicycles and also by raising the overlook you um, can accommodate greater sea level rise and you're less likely to have trouble with wave run up hitting the, the underside of the deck, the, the soffit, the bottom of the deck. I don't feel super strongly about it, but um, you know the cost of, of the pile being a couple of feet longer is, is pretty insignificant, I think, relative to the overall cost of the thing. So I just didn't understand the design. And then they said that something about wanting to keep it low so you can maintain views from the hotel. So maybe that's... I kind of like that too. Yeah, could we go to a plan view? Um, yeah, Tom, you were just going to say something about this as well. I, I kind of like Bob's idea, as long as it's not too much, because uh, provided you can get ADA up to this deck, it would keep bikes from from, from veering in there. And uh, number yeah. one, and number two, I was going to say, gosh, such an awfully sharp corner on the bike trail. But then on the other hand, that'll slow people down. So maybe that's good. Yeah, I mean, I it was funny. I it was, there's something about right at the corner. You have the access from the hotel. It looks like a path coming down right on the on the turn point. And yeah. I, it just seems like that's a if you're coming from the hotel, that's a natural crossing point into this area. I, I just thought like the resolution. Maybe you know there could be a, a bit more study made of Did exactly the how geometry is a little awkward. Works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on at that area. Would it, is it fenced or is it completely open to the waterfront there? I guess, anyway, I, I guess we would need to see some exhibits. I think. In order for me to comment, I would want to see more detail there. I think. I think, yeah, I mean, a, a softer geometry at that turn feels like that would be helpful. But also, um, if that is a public area, which I don't know if it is or not, but if it is public, I think providing a wider access and more points of access into it would be helpful because right now it feels very much like it has a kind of a setback uh, with a limited sort of garden path into it uh, rather than kind of like a gracious public access. So if it's meant to be public, I would say, uh, it doesn't look very public right now. Yeah, we have no details on the, the light green zone that runs all the way along there, but that is public space. So it, it, it could, we don't know because we don't have an exhibit that shows us more detail, but it could be perceived as being the hotel garden, if you like. So. Um, you know, there could be ways to, I think, ease the alignment of the path a bit, you know, or make, as that develops, make some uh, accommodation for maybe seating or so on on the other side, the inland side of the, the path as well. Because it's a great place for, for viewing. Yeah. Somebody needs to sit down and design both sides of it more carefully. It just seems very dis dis kind of disconnected in that clear. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I think with that, uh, I think that concludes the board discussion. Uh, and so, and, and there's been a lot of feedback. We've got some, you know, critical areas that people have talked about. I won't read all the notes. I know we will have notes and everyone has taken notes. Um, but I think, you know, in, in the, at a very high level, I think some of the critical areas that we've touched on is enhanced access 
particularly you know, looking for those additional connections through part of the site and adjacent areas that could help with uh, broader access from the community into the site. Uh, I think there's been a strong feeling from the board uh, that the uh, interior basin uh, and the transitions into the basin uh, need more study or we need to know more about what the work that you're doing for that area, longer term, I understand. Uh, we, uh, there's, a, there's a lot that we want to recognise that's uh, very positive about it, but about the, the new plan. But the, the basin seems like a, uh, just, there's not much information of, about it at this stage. Uh, there's some concerns about phase one and whether, and, and knowing that phase one may only be for a few years, uh, that's one way to look at it. But uh, the question, you know, there's always the unknowns that prevent the ultimate phases occurring in a very rapid timeline. And so, you know, what's the contingency plan there? Uh, and then uh, I think uh, there's, you know, some um, very uh, good feedback. Uh, on some of the transitions, riprap, um, uh, some of the views, potential weather protection from winds, um, thinking through how much lawn is really needed in the final stage for the park. Uh, and we, talk, we talked about a lot of other things, but I'm just looking at my notes, picking out some of the, the critical areas. Can I make one comment? Uh, you know, let, let's say, for example, that um, none of the great ideas that were mentioned occurred and we were just dealing with a conventional park. I think the, the most important thing would be to have a soil profile plan to really understand, like, what is engineered backfill and what is horticultural soil that would be imported. Because I think that really, you know, you can draw circles on the plan and trees in section, but without the proper volume of soil to support those items, like none of it will go anywhere. So um, it's not something that I think is required or that we normally ask for, but but I think um, I think of the fill as being engineered backfill. I mean, it's basically a levy and it can't, um, you know, dissipate very easily, right? It's really built to last. So that's not really a growing medium. So having reservoirs of soil or however you want to think about it, I think each tree in in an urban setting, in this urban setting, needs to be planned for with you know 500 or 1,000 cubic feet of you know sandy loam imported or something. And it would be great to see where that's going to occur. And just a follow-on point from that too. I think the um, you know there's a lot of areas shown for recharging the the, the soil. Or, and to your point, if it's engineered fill, it may be very difficult for for uh, you know the water to make way down into the, the materials below. So I think that needs study as well, which a soil profile would really help illustrate that. Okay, uh, so I think that concludes our board discussion. The next uh, part of this uh, sequence is for the project proponent uh, to make a brief response if you would like to do that. Uh, hi, all. Katie Bowman. I'm an uh, economic development manager at the city, and it's been my uh, pleasure to be m overall project manager for the Shoreline, or what we call the Shoreline Project since 2018. Cynthia Battenberg, who you may have seen previously from the city, who worked on it since its inception, handed it off to me. So um, I wanted to just start, um, you know, we really want to thank you for, I think, really very thoughtful comments, um, certainly thinking about the great assets that we have here. And I can I can start by talking about, I know you nodded to wanting to hear about what the goals and the constraints are for the project, um, which is a really valid question. And so, you know, I think they, they talked some in the staff report about what the goals were for the park, um, for the project overall since its inception with the formation of uh, the community advisory group, which was 20 or 30 people that worked really really carefully for a long time 
they did establish um, some specific goals for the project which we've been carrying through. And I can't quote them all this very moment, but you know, you know, in general, they, they talked about, there's, there's a couple different things and a couple that are particularly relevant for, for your question and comment there. So obviously part of it is to, um, well, so yeah, you know, their, their goals are to enhance the experience in this location. I appreciate that you found it to be people enjoying it right now, but it is not in a state right now that we find sustainable, safe, or recommended. And so we physically need to make improvements there. But as a city, for all of us, we need to think about how we can do things in a fiscally sustainable manner. And so um, a big goal of this project from the get-go, from you know, 2008, 2010, was to look at how the project can be self-sustaining and not be supported by, you know, to the extent feasible, not supported by the general fund. And so we do, we do um, and so the whole uh, business arrangement and kind of development was designed to utilize selling a portion of the golf course to build a fun park. And so because the city has so many different needs, um, our, our, in, our engineering team has got a very long list of PIP needs, and so we, we tried to help this project help to support itself. So that's, so that's a big part of our goal. And then bringing in the public-private partnership with the private development will allow for that and to be able to fund all of this public improvement. And obviously all of the different service needs, that'll come from housing, things like that. And so, um, and so through that, you know, we have long-term the development, you know, it's, it's, with all of these, it's getting the development to happen that will then help support things. And so there will be different um, things once it is developed, the formation of the community facilities district that is similar actually to what they're doing on some projects in Alameda um, that you may or may not have seen, but um, looking at how that, through that, the development, the actual future uh, tenants and residents will help to fund the ongoing maintenance and really to make it a quality, we as cities want to really think going forward, how can we, the kind of old fiscal model doesn't work, and so how can we continue to fund things at this higher level to start to accommodate for these raising costs of sea level rise and other things. So long term, it will, it, will, it will have the ability to help with maintenance on an ongoing basis as well as a bonding ability long term, but, that, but that's looking to the long term, and so that doesn't come till the development comes. And so um, with our current constraints, looking at what the, what the initial revenue from the development will generate, and that's kind of where the phase one and, and different phases came in, um, as well as so, so other goals of the project have been to, um, to help enhance people's connection with the bay um, and really naturalize the area, to uh, bring amenities to the community, to bring additional housing to the community. This is a really significant, for our community, 500 units, um, um, you know, to get that built will be very, very valuable to, to bringing um, housing to the community um, and then um, as well as providing um, the, the different things, the hotel, which, which is a need of our business community, um, and restaurants and gathering places, which with the Blue Dolphin leaving me, we still have community members, including our mayor, remembering how they had their, their prom reception there and things like that. So really, it, the, the area does um, have, have, a, have a community asset for longstanding community members. But um, through a number of the different programming things that will come from uh, the new development, there will be a, a, a TDM plan developed and other types of things that come with helping to develop ways to get shuttle and other types of um, shared transportation access out there. Um, and, and so you asked about, those are our overarching goals for the project. We, we, do, we do have, you know, we, we do with everything we do have to look at financial constraints. Um, and so the, the big challenges that the project uh, faces, you know, related to sea level rise, we have made those a primary, um, a primary priority, but that has a cost implication. And so, right, that's how, with, with dealing with the sea level rise has big cost implications that, that you know, are, are bigger than probably initially, in, you know, budgeted and things like that. So, so you know, that's, that's how we have prioritized our work out there, whether, whether that's what the, what the, uh, commission agrees with, but you know, so that that's kind of what our thoughts were going into it. 
and, and with things, with addressing sea level rise, you, you do what you can where, we, where you can. And so it's obviously a big, a big challenge that all cities are looking at. And so certainly we can't solve everything with this project, but where this project can help within its scope, that's what we're, what we're looking to do. Um, and so uh, I, I, will, I can stop on, on that point. I know as well you had a number of very detailed and specific comments, and I'll probably look to the team to answer on some of those. I, I would say overall, um, you know, one, one comment in particular, and in, uh, engineering may speak a little more, I did hear kind of uh, thoughts about uh, the, bike, the bike path, the, uh, the class one bike trail along Monarch Bay Drive. I know that that was something that we were thoughtful about working with our engineering and transportation division. And based on their recommendation, that eastern um, um, lineup was made and also to align with the trail to the south. But I think certainly um, we can provide more background on kind of what the thought was going into that. And then in looking at the different phases, I think that's something as well that we can look at and think about. We, um, you know, as we, this is a, a long-term project, so we are continually working on, on grant funding and, and looking out for that. A lot of the grant funding needs um, shovel-ready projects, and so it's, the project's just not prime right now for the grant funding. But, um, but, but certainly we're always looking to leverage. Actually, we were very grateful the city was able to, a portion of the funds were, were gonna need be needed for the new library out there, but actually the city has successfully gotten grant funding for that, so that's great. Every little bit helps, and so also we are gonna be working with our sustainability manager who has gotten the CAL FIRE grant for I think about 5,000 trees. Um, and so we're going to look to potentially use that for things out here as well. And so, um, you know, it's not, um, you know, like I said, we're in, and so we, but we want to continue on the planning so that we can, that we can prime the project. And so I think as, as John mentioned, obviously we'll, we'll build as much as, as we can when, when we can, but we wanted to be, you know, not be, be, um, you know, not not commit to more than we could technically commit to. And so that was the thought with the phasing. Um, and then also a thought, and, and I know John, John may want to speak or maybe just at another time we could provide more detail. I know on the interior, um, the thoughts um, were very interesting and, and helpful, I think. And, and we'll think about that some more. Cause, and I know we had looked at the riprap on the interior. You want to speak on that, John? Yeah, I can speak to that. The, the, the main reason why we're, currently not contemplating taking out the riprap on the interior basin is in spite of the fact that it's not as exposed as the exterior portion, our engineering staff that studies this have said that if you don't have any kind of protection for st slope stability, it will erode. And so if you pull out the riprap, we would have to do some other sta slope stabilization like a seawall or something like that, which is vastly more expensive and, and really cost prohibitive. So. We need to have some kind of slope stability on the interior basin. Um, and, and so our idea of trying to strike the right balance is to provide uh, a softening of the edge while we're still maintaining the, the current slope stability that's in place. And I, I have some other comments that might respond to some of your other questions, but I don't want to take up too much time. Um, no, I mean, I just, I'll make two more, uh, just what were just one note was just, or, you know, I think we can talk more on the boat launch as well, I think some of those comments were, were, were welcome and interesting. And, um, and just to notice that, yeah, I mean, currently it is not uh, very heavily used at, at all. Our, our main use Correct. is an emergency user. And then there is a mile or is it a two mile channel out to the bay? Yeah. So we, that is also a challenge um, with, with boating. So, area. yeah, the boat launch. It does have, uh, according to Public Works, it has very, very limited use, and it's primarily um, served as an emergency access for county fire in the event that there's a, an event related to the um, uh, Oakland Airport. Um, the main reason why we re relocated it to where we did is because it's actually deeper water out there, and it actually makes it more useful. To answer the question about parking and the turnaround and the congestion, there's just there's only so much space you can fit there. And, to, and so we've, we've tried to strategize how you can get a truck and trailer. And if you notice in the, in the plan, it's actually oriented in a way so that a person could launch their boat, come out and nose in, 
And then when they go to retrieve their boat, they back out, they go down, and we built the roundabout for this purpose so you can loop around to go retrieve your boat. There's, not, there's just no physical way you can have any other route to, to get your boat there in that regard. Um, if I if I, if if I got time, I want to touch on some of your other comments just to make sure that we've talked. Yeah, through if you them. could just keep it to a couple of minutes. Okay, so that'd be great. Um, the arrival is actually we believe enhanced by the straightening of Mulford Point, so we're trying to actually open the arrival and the access to the park rather than it feeling obscured. Um, the fencing around the hotel is only around the pool, so that entire patio area you see, you see is open to the public, and that developer is actually in, hoping that the public engages because they want to sell food and beverage and they want to invite people in to that's that's a revenue source for them um, the uh, the lawn areas are not just envisioned as just big flat grassy areas we're trying to use some lumpy grasses in some areas we're, we're, we're envisioning some mounds in other areas we're envisioning some other areas with boulders the main goal is is just to cre to create an environment that is interesting and interactive but not necessarily open to large-scale sporting activities and so that's why there's grasses, but they are going to be diverse in nature. Um, and the CFD does envision maintain, or paying for the maintenance of phase one. So it won't be that we just hydro seed it and, you know, kind of walk away. 